Hi, and welcome to the Engineers HVAC podcast. Our mission here is to educate and empower the commercial HVAC community. And my name is Tony Mormino. I'm your host today. And I have a very special HVAC, our VIP guest today, Don Gillis with Chemors. And we're going to talk about the R Fortune transition. We're going to talk about A2L refrigerants. And we'd love this to be interactive. So if you have questions, this is a great opportunity to, to pick Don's brain. He's one of the industry leaders here and very valuable resource for us. And I have put together probably 10 or 12 of the most common questions we get on the transition and what is A2L and all, all the things that go along with this. So please um, comment if you will. Great. Please, Don, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic, Tony. Great. Uh, so it's getting ready to snow here in Ohio, but I'm doing great. Nice. So you're Don's in Ohio. I'm up here in Asheville, North Carolina. So, um, and we are so glad you all are watching and you're here with us live today. This is a live recording of our podcast. This will also be available on our podcast, which you can get by clicking the QR code up there in the upper left. So Don, I think I'm just going to run right into it. So we, you and I have done a couple of presentations on our YouTube channel, the basics of, you know, here's the deadlines, here's the transitions. Today, maybe we'll dive a little deeper in some of the particulars. I got some questions here. You feel free to talk about whatever you want. And again, if you're listening, please throw some questions in the chat. So let's go ahead and hit it. Let's hit it with the first um, question we get all the time. What are the manufacturing deadlines for new equipment containing R or 10A? Yeah, so th they're going to be, uh, so as of January 1st of 2025, they'll stop uh, um no longer be making equipment with 410A in it. Well, let me let me back up a little bit. They've extended, the EPA has extended the sell-through date on the equipment, as we talked about, you and I privately offline a couple days ago or whatever. But so on the on the, on the the mini splits, or the mini splits, the split systems, it'll be a sell-through date until uh, 2026, January 1st of 2026. So they back that up a year. Um, there's a three-year extension from uh, to 2028, on package units. So that's, when I say package units, that could be electric, that could be gas, that could be, uh, basically the way I describe that, Tony, is anything that comes off the assembly line that is a full system already. You just plug it in and it works. If you have to connect the dots with a line set or something, that will be 2026. But beyond that, uh, anything else that comes off the line that can actually be wired up and ran uh, that will be 2020, January 1st of 2028. So that's the deadline. So I have a question on that because I'm a little yeah. bit confused. So sell through date, what actually does that mean? Does that mean, is that different than leaving the factory date? So the sell through date would be, uh, and again, we have people that sit on these committees. I want to be very transparent about this for regulations and uh you know, those kind of things, those affairs. So it's not the world mm -hmm. I live in every day, but from what I understand of it, and I think I understand it, but I could be wrong is, is so anything in a warehouse, there was concern that wholesalers, distributors would be sitting on equipment and not be able to get that out by 2026 mm. pretty much is what the, what the idea was or 2025. Um, so they have a sell through date. So if they're sitting on all this equipment, whether it's stocked up at the, the factory or in the warehouse of the wholesaler distributor, they'll be able to sell it up until that date. Now, where it gets a little slippery for me and, and our internal people is because they're still just to be clear, they're still in conversations about that. I mean, this mm -hmm. was supposed to be the final rule a month or two ago. Well, that wasn't the case. Obviously, they extended that. So from what I'm understanding is there's still conversations going on, uh, not only with our team, but those teams that sit in with these EPA about what sell through date really means as far as when it comes to the contract. Does that make sense? So yep. the, like when, where I worked at my last job, we were very, very high volume. It was not unusual for us to have a bunch of split systems set in the warehouse ready to pull for after hour calls. So yep. that, you know, I think, part of the process is at the EPA and others that don't live in that world, understanding how the contractor and distributor world works setting on that equipment. So it's right. a little, it's a little gray or muddy, if you will, at the time. But right now, what we do know is on the split systems, things you have to uh, install on the field, uh, the line set, connecting those dots, those will be until 2026. 
uh, for the for the uh, contractor. And then on the splits are the package units, like I said, will be 2028. 20, now, like I said, the reason I said, explained, went into great detail explaining contractor versus distributor was I fired that question internally not long ago. And that's when I was told exactly what I just mm -hmm. explained to you. Basically, I'm repeating what I was just told um, that that's where there's still some confusion, if you will. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up about the confusion. And if you're watching this, check with people after you watch this because things are changing on this particular issue is what i understand right so absolutely let me make sure i let i'm gonna spit this these dates out here and you tell me yeah what, yeah we think that's right so from a standpoint of ordering a piece of equipment from a factory like we'll forget about vrf because that's a little bit different we'll talk about that in a second so package rooftop unit chiller cannot leave a factory after the end of this year with 410a or a high gwp refrigerator correct yes if you have correct. okay if you have that package unit or chiller in your warehouse in this december you have till 2028 to sell it to resell it that's the sell through that is correct Tony. Yes. that's what we yeah. understand okay and then yep. split systems is kind of the same january 1st 20 um other than vrf split systems <laughs> Could this be any more confusing, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and, you need like this big pie chart and flow chart. You um, know what's funny about it is it's not the world, like I said, I live in every day. It's not the world yeah. you probably live in every day. I see you speak on a lot of different topics. I came from the compressor world. Uh, it's it's refreshing to know when I speak to the people that sit on these panels, they can't just say, hold oh, on, it's this or that right away. And yeah, I don't feel yeah. like an idiot. You know what I mean? So it's not just you. It's not just me. Trust me. Yeah, that's why we always have the caveat. Please check back. So the split system commercial product other than VRF, 1125, it cannot have a high GWP, GWP refrigerant. And if you have that in the warehouse before 1125, you got to install it before you get a year, basically, to install it. Um, Correct. VRF, VRF, you get uh, till 2026 from it leaving the factory. They get an extra year. For whatever reason, I'm not sure why that is, but maybe because it's more complex to change that refrigerant. I'm not sure. Um, that's my guess. Anyway. Okay, Don, thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, move on to the next question. So we get this all the time. I'm sure you've heard this 100 times. Can R454B or R32 be used as a drop in for 410A? No. And the easy answer is no. And, and hopefully, and, and those are some of the things that I teach along the road. You know, I travel a lot. I'm in front of contractors all the time, like you teach online and what have you. And, and, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a no, no. Um, so there, you know, there's so many obvious reasons there. It's, it's a different, like for 454 B it's a different blend than 410 a obviously, uh, not to mention it's an A2L, uh, the safety features at this time, there's no retrofit kit for 410 a equipment. Um, so, uh, that's, that's a big no, no, uh, R32, basically the same thing. I mean, you're talking about two different components or two different, uh, refrigerants there. So, uh, you know, TXVs are going to have different pressure settings, those kind of things. Uh, you know, uh, not to mention on the 410A or the 454B, pardon me, uh, that will be, they'll all three be different compressors. Okay. And uh, you'll have, uh, and, and I don't live in that world anymore, but I do know uh, a little bit about the compressors. So the 410A uh, will have the PoE 32. That will be a replacement compressor for repairs. You'll have a 454B compressor, PoE 32. But there's been some changes internally on that compressor to deal with the HFO molecules as far as material-wise. So that will not be, it doesn't act like a duck, walk like a duck, talk like a duck, even though they look fairly similar in pressure temperatures and those kind of things. So we can't be swapping those out. There's that. And then you have uh, R32. And R32, obvious, for obvious reasons, uh, it's, it's a different refrigerant. But not only that, that PoE oil is going to be higher. It's going to be a PoE 46, um, simply because R32 naturally runs a little warmer. Okay, that was the whole, and I think we've discussed this before, but, and this goes way back to my, my, er, my earlier career of, uh, you know, R32, our 410A, half of 410A is R32, the other half is R125, and the two biggest reasons, personally, that I think of R25 in there, it makes it non-flammable, you find that chemical in fire extinguishers also, 
but the but the other thing that 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 wasn't that well known is it keeps that discharge line a little cooler so if you look at the temperatures of uh let's say you know 410a if it's all in the same application for example 410a on the discharge line will run right around 179 uh 454b will run right around 190 and then r32 will run right around 215 degrees so that oil has to be a higher viscosity, thicker, mm. uh, possibility of more friction, you know, and uh, so those kind of things. So you have three different compressors, even though they look similar on a PT chart, not exact, but similar, that will be a big difference. Again, going back to that TXV, anytime we change refrigerants, you're going to change that pressure setting on that TXV. So most of the things in the, uh, you know, the coils and those things like that, uh, material wise are going to stay pretty much the same, but there is some changes in that 454 B compressor uh, because of that HFO molecule uh, material wise. And that's, that's, uh, that's as much as I can really say about that. Cause that's not the world I live in anymore. Right. And I'll comment on this side of it. And so everybody knows who's watching. So Don works for Chemors manufacturer, our 54 B. So his specialty is in the refrigerant itself. And like, some of the questions we get maybe relate more to the equipment side that Don's going to give his experience on from his from his many years in the industry. And I will say from the fourth, you know, we get this question all the time, right? I got an R14A machine. Can I top it off with one of these new refrigerants or could I just take it out, take out the 14 a and put in the new? And the answer to that's no for the reasons that Don is is touting, which are great technical reasons. It's also illegal. <laughs> it will also void the warranty of your yeah. equipment. So if you've got an $80,000 packaged, you know, DOAS system and you do this, you're taking on all the liability of that equipment. And it also will avoid the UL rating is my understanding. So it's a major, major thing. You could get in big trouble, lose your license. So don't, don't risk it. Right. Yeah. So that's what yeah, I'm and, and at the level I work at every day, Tony, and the different cities that I'm in, it's a contractor level. So that question gets brought up a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, probably every other class, if not every class. And I simply say, you know, as simple as is, I try to give a vision and what that vision looks like is what you said, what I said, but then at the end of the day, how good is your PT chart? I mean, can you do superheat and subcooling if you think it's 410A in there and you've got 454B in there? You never want to mix refrigerants. I, I always cringe. I think most of us do as instructors uh, when we hear the word, the term drop in. I've never cared for that. You drop something in on top of something else. I see you laughing, but then you've just invented your yeah. new Frankenstein yeah. refrigerant. And right. again, how good is your PT chart? Where where do you even know where you're at on anything? You know, even if they're very close, they're still different. So, um, yeah, so that's going to be a big no-no. Big no-no. Don't do it. Don't risk it. Okay, so, you know, get this question. What is the EPA final technology transition rule? Do you want to talk about that, Don, in your experience? You know, to me, it's just like, um, I have a picture of it here. Yeah. This is the breakdown of it. Yeah. And I'll put a link if you're watching this in the future or watching it or listening to it on podcast, look at the show notes and I'll put a link into this, this uh, what's called the technology transition rule. So you want, can you fill us in on what that actually is? I, I, I think I have an idea, but yeah, yeah. I, you, you may know more about it than I do. So I'm going to get a, you at a very <laughs> high level on the technology transition rule is into effect in October of last year it was the second step if you will of the aim act okay um and what the way i explain that in the classroom is simply this is it's the applications so if it's a split system if it's a reach in if it's a you know commercial refrigeration that it will be based on how many pounds are in that refrigerant and um and what the GWP is. So they interact with each other as far as that. The way I like to think of that is because I used to teach supermarkets and, and, and larger classes on the commercial refrigeration side prior to coming here at Copeland is the longer the line set, the more opportunity for leaks, the smaller window you will have for refrigerants as far as GWP. So that's a, that's a good part of the, ah. of, of the application type thing. That's that. So the smaller that GW or that line set gets, the higher the GWP gets. And I always share that with contractors that only do air conditioning. Actually, uh, we have, you know, we have a better opportunity here with more opportunities, R32, 454B, those kind of things, uh, where other, uh, the larger those line sets, that window starts to close in on you. You know what I mean? So 
that's my definition. That doesn't get in the weeds of what it is. Uh, you probably have more to add than that, but uh, that's how I see the technical transition. It's just the, the 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 systems, the way the applications are, how much refrigerant is in the system, whether it's 200 pounds, less than 200 pounds, or over 200 pounds. That changes things. If it's o over 200 pounds of commercial refrigeration, the maximum is 150 GWP. If it's lower than 200 pounds, it's less than 300 GWP. We have so we we have a 454B for air conditioning. That's less than 700, as we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a 454A and a 454C. The 454A has a higher GWP, so that will be lower than the 200 pounds. The 454C has a lower GWP, at a, uh, so that'll be the less than 150 pounds. And when I say lower, they're way lower, like the. 454A, for example, is 238, so it's way below that 300. Same components in those refrigerants. It's a 454 series, but that R32 and that uh, 1234YF shift. So it may be a ratio of 80-20. It may be a ratio of 50-50. It may be a ratio of 60-40. But each one of those can fit a different application based on the pounds and the GWP. So you hit all the marks. We like to refer to it. And I'm going to do a shameless plug is it's as simple as ABC with the 454 series. <laughs> right, get it. Marketing's going to love me for that. Tony. I was just going to say, you got that from a marketing guy. I'm sure. <laughs> nah, thanks. You actually educated me on a lot of stuff and it's a good segue into this uh, next question. And I'm going to pull up a, a slide here. So you tell me like, here's a question I got from one of our guys. Let me okay. get rid of this overlay here just so we can see it a little bit better. So, um, the question was, what about equipment other than commercial HVAC? And you just talked about this, right? Process chillers, refrigeration equipment, grocery store equipment. You know, I, I refer them to this part of the transition guide we just talked about, which has the subsectors in it, which is what you were referring to. Like vending machines have a different GWP requirement than package rooftop units and process chillers and water coolers and stuff like that. So if you have a question about something else, one of the other subsectors you can you can look here, but I didn't know the 150 GWP max was based on the volume of the refrigerant uh, as opposed to like, my thought was if you could do it, if you could use propane, then okay, you give them a 150 limit, but you're telling me it's actually because of the poundage in the equipment, which yeah. is news to me. So that's good. Yeah. So the propane is a hundred. It's that is uh that's based on grams. Propane is at 150 grams now, R290. And UL passed, it seems like it was yesterday, but it's been some months now uh, to move it to 300, 400, four, or uh, 300, 500, pardon me, Tony. 500 mm -hmm. would be cases uh, that don't have doors and drawers on them. So that would be going into your grocery store with open cases where you can reach right in and grab the product. If it has a door or a drawer on it where that gas can be trapped, then it'll be lower milligrams. But that's the R290 propane that that's where that 150 grams is maximum right now um but what i'm talking about is the pounds for uh the uh the hfos the hfo blends and those kind of things that's 150 a uh, less than 150 uh gwp not grams uh will be on the 200 pound or less 200 pounds or more it's 300 gwp uh or less basically so it's based on the larger the charge the less opportunity of GWPs you have, basically. The more opportunity for leaks is the way I like to explain it. Uh, if you blow the charge, how much GWP is in that refrigerant? So uh, gotcha. the, the less the charge, the the more opportunities I like to say you have as far as selection of refrigerants, basically. Very good explanation. Thank you. And by the way, that question was by Dennis Millay with our Hobbs, uh, Hobbs office in Maryland. So thank you, Dennis, for providing that question. Okay. Let's see here what we got here. Um, we talked about the sell-through dates. That was another question by Dennis. Thank you, Dennis, for the question. Um, we talked about the oil. So just to, so for my own experience, and I'm I'm actually uh, speaking at the ASHRAE meeting in Manitoba, Canada this afternoon. So one of my slides talks about the oil. So you'll help me here with this. R32, for, uh, I'm sorry, R454B and 410A use the same PoE of 32. But because of the higher discharge temp, R32 needs higher viscosity oil, which is PoE 46. Did I get yeah. that right? 
Yeah. And, and if you want to refer that to, again, this goes back to my Copeland days. If you want to reference that, um, you can go to any uh, compressor manufacturer, their AE bulletins, application engineer bulletins. Copeland's would be the application engineer bulletin 93-11. If you go to 93-11 for Copeland, that will show you uh, all the refrigerants, all the oils, and what applications they're allowed into. And you'll see that POE oil or or whatever oil they're using, whether it's PAG, mm -hmm. mineral, or whatever, you'll see what that application, it's it's spelled right out there with all three of them that you have on the screen now. Excellent. Okay. Very good information. Let's see what we got here next. And and Don, you feel free if you got a, something on your, your mind you want to talk about that's yeah. important or timely, you please throw it in there. Um, Again, this has to do with something after the fact, and I don't know if you know. Um, I can tell you what I've been told on this. So, there any special transportation uh, considerations for A2L refrigerants? With so, Service Tech's got a a van. Are there any special considerations as far as putting an A2L jug of refrigerant in there, other than the practices he normally follows today? Yeah. So, um, here's what I know. Uh, Department of Transportation, under the Materials of Trades Act, it's business as usual. What I mean by that is there's always been a maximum of pounds of anything you carry in tanks on your truck. And that was mm -hmm. always 440 pounds, not in one tank. Obviously, that's your settling. That's your 410A, your R22, everything. All together. All, All together. together. Combined okay. maximum gotcha. 440 pounds. That has not changed. So that's kind of refreshing to know that, that we were going to A2L refrigerants, mildly flammable, and that didn't go down to 400 or 350, you mm -hmm. know, so it's still 440 pounds. As far as placards go, nothing's changed. There will be no placards needed for that. Um, the other one I commonly hear is uh, a year ago, and, and I'm out, it seems like I'm out there myth busting basically a lot of times like you are, uh, <laughs> but there's no ventilation in the vans. That was another, you know, scuttlebutt about a year ago. There was talk of that also. Um, uh, some of the other things is tanks being laid on their side. Um, now, I want to be fair about this. You have to petition that um, Department of Transportation uh, of the Materials and Trade Act to get a special uh, permit to lay your A2L tanks on their side. Comores has done that but I can't speak for everyone because I seen a webinar six weeks ago, major refrigerant mm -hmm. manufacturer that stated A2Ls cannot be laid on their side. So I can't speak for everyone. In fact, when I talk about that in classroom, my next slide is actually not that anybody thinks I'm mi misleading them, but I actually show the permit number. So the Comores products, and again, I'm not trying to do a shameless plug here. I'm just speaking facts because I don't want people misinformed if somebody else comes in behind me and says, they cannot right. be laid because I just heard it on a very large webinar not long ago with a platform that's very well watched. Um, it's not a to all A2Ls have to be upright. OK, you have to petition that you have to get a special put uh, a number and permit number. And it's going to be stamped on our tanks that it's allowed to. So they made you go through the testing. And the reason for that, Tony, is not to go down a rabbit hole is that that uh, pressure disc that uh, ruptured disc that we know all about it's always been good practice to have that at the 12 o'clock position uh they want a vapor barrier there now that we're going to this relief valve on tanks the same concepts holds true and good practice is always to put that when you're laying on side the way the vans are tooled or racked you want that in the 12 o'clock position so we had to go through that special testing to make sure that something didn't prematurely rupture by swaying around refrigerant inside the tank. It passed with flying colors. And uh, so we, we've got a special permit. And uh, and they're probably working on that behind the scenes right now themselves. But I just want to make sure I correct that because uh, there was a lot of people on that call not long ago. And uh, it that uh, not all A2Ls have to be upright. You have to request that permit or petition, if you will. So, and, and that and, is requested by the manufacturer, not the service tech or the company that's purchasing correct. it. Is that right? Yes, okay. Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, so, and that was like a two-year process from our internal people, from what I understand. So that was a long, long process. I'm sure they were all high fiving each other when we got that passed. So, uh, <laughs> because you know, think about it. I mean, in a truck, it's just not real world. 
you know, they're already tooled up. Can you imagine the changes you'd have to do? Yeah. Right? If you, everything had to be upright, it would be a nightmare. So that's mm-hmm. really as small as it sounds is a pretty big deal. So, um, and there's going to be a lot of A2Ls out there, not just Camorse products, but everybody's products. So, you mm-hmm. know, I, I try to remove the fear mongering within, uh, within the, the technicians is basically goal one when I start to uh, do my training. But uh, last but not least, now we're going back to those placards on, uh, you know, big box trucks, semis, and those things will be a whole different thing. We're just talking yeah. about service fans now. Just, just I know you know that, but just for the folks listening in. Yeah, very good, uh, you know, distinction there. We're only talking about your local service guy. When you're talking about a 50-ton piece of equipment leaving the factory and shipping federally, um, I could share something here that we got from one of our manufacturers. Let me see if I could share this real quick. So it's a little bit hard to read, but I'll read it. It basically has two special permits and they are differentiated by the capacity of refrigerant in the unit, not in each individual circuit, but in the unit itself. And it says units with less than 44 pounds. Um, This has to do again with semi-truck transportation. Units with less than 44 pounds of refrigerant, complete exemption from hazmat regs, Placards on the truck trailer are not required. No air or water transport. And it said um, incidents with gas released must be reported to USDOT. So, you know, 44 pounds, you're thinking maybe a 30-ish kind of ton unit to give a frame of reference as to what size unit that would be. The other special permit is for units with 44 to 5,000 pounds of refrigerant. Not a complete exemption from hazmat regulations. Placards on the truck trailer are not required. Labels must be on at least two sides of the unit. Labels must be visible without unloading the unit. Must be transported on an open trailer or flatbed rail car or well-ventilated, excuse me, transport vehicle, no air or water transport. So that's what we know. It also is a clarification in here. This is like may change. It's not 100% for sure. So check back. This is another one of those, please, whatever you hear here regarding these regulations, please uh, check with your local manufacturer's rep or your local trusted source. So, Yeah, that's good news. I I wasn't aware of that. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, No problem. Okay, so another thing about the tanks while we're still on the, the tank. So all the tanks... I understand now are gray or going to gray. And then there's a, if there's a red stripe around the tank, that means it's an A2L refrigerant. Do I have that right down? I'm not really sure. Yeah. I'm not a tech. So. Yeah, you are correct. And that'll, that'll hold true for the uh, recovery tanks uh, also, but let's stick with the refrigerant tanks themselves. going to have a left-hand threads. You'll need a small mm. adapter. Um, and, and one of the biggest reasons for that is, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk of things like that, you know, it's a money grab or whatever, but when you stop and think about it, it would have been a lot more expensive for tool manufacturers, OEMs, and everyone else to tool up uh, to try to make left-hand threads for all their equipment and all their tools. And oh, by the way, they're still making stuff for A1 refrigerants that's still going to need to be replaced Mm -hmm. or repaired and those kind of things. So it was much easier for the industry to put that adapter in there and connect those dots. I like it. I didn't at first. I didn't couldn't wrap my head around it because I thought left-hand threads are going to make adapter. Well, that's what they wanted to do. So mm-hmm. as many folks as I see and other trainers see when you travel nationally is like it or not, we're very short help out there. And Jim or Julie sometimes are being put in positions they're not ready to do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they're being moved for preventive maintenance, Tony, to service, you know, when it gets 90 degrees outside, like literally overnight. OK, it happened yep. to me. It happens to everyone. OK, so on a on my thought process here on this, I want that adapter there personally. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and, and speak, speak my feelings on it is simply because, you know, if someone gets put in that position on day one, and they go out there with their A1 hoses or their right-handed th- uh, hoses, threads, and go to put on that left-handed uh, tank, A2Ls, and they, they're not that knowledgeable. They didn't go to training, uh, and they make that phone call to the service manager or someone else and says, hey, I don't want to sound like an idiot, but my hoses mm-hmm. won't go on there. Hopefully, someone like yourself, a service manager, a, a co-worker, a good friend, a counterperson will say, stop what you're doing. Is there a red stripe around it? Yes, there is. 
that's an A2L. It's a learning process. I'd rather them learn that way than the hard way, right? Even mm -hmm. though these flammabilities are so close, A2L refrigerants are are much closer to, to an A1 than anything else. I mean, they're they're by far closer to an A1 than they are even an A2. Uh, forget A3s. I mean, that's apples and oranges, completely mm -hmm. off the charge difference. So, but yeah, you'll have the red stripe on there. You'll have the red band around there. And then last but not least, if you care to know, they're going to go with a relief valve on the tank instead of a rupture disc just to go that extra mile. Okay, it was required. Uh, rupture disc will blow the whole charge. They very seldom happens. Uh, I've never seen it happen in Ohio. I guess it can happen or will happen, has happened in the southern states in the right conditions. Uh, but this relief valve will simply burp the tank and then set it back mm. and then shut it off. So another extra step on that. So I, I kind of like the left-handed threads. And oh, by the way, we've been using those in the auto industry for how long? I mean, that's very common practice. So it's not, we're a tough industry. We'll get through this. But yes, the red band will be prevalent. It'll be like an eggshell. It depends really what color you see. Some folks will say beige. Some folks will say off gray. Uh, but that the difference in the two will be the red band and not the red band. A1s, no band. Uh, A2Ls will have that red band around the top of that. Got it. And I personally am interested in any technology that will help me from making a big mistake. So <laughs> I would be a big fan of that because right. I know I know for me, like even if I know, like I'm busy, I'm thinking about this, I'm on the phone, I'm doing this, and I might not just not, not be paying attention and, and just do that wrong. And you don't want to, I don't know what the circumstances would be if you put this into a non-approved machine, but I would say you'd have to take it all out. I'm sure there's procedures, but we won't get into all that. But uh, it kind of reminds me of the diesel fuel thing I'm, for my truck. It's got the bigger nozzle. You can't put it in a in a car. Now, I will tell you, you could put regular fuel in a diesel truck, which I am shocked I haven't done in the four years I've owned a diesel because of my mind is all. So it kind of just remind you know what I mean? I mean, I did all yeah. the help I can get. So it reminds me of that. Anything well, that keeps it simple and you know, it's all about protecting liability, safety. It's it's not to suffer people. And I don't know that the parts guys are making a lot of money off these little threaded adapters, but um, you know, it's all about protecting the yeah. business, protecting the worker, the the owner, and everybody involved. So, yeah, and anyone that's done many splits for the last since many splits have been around, you've always had to have an adapter to make it a larger. Uh, fitting to adapt to your hoses too. And then the contractors out there that are listening, in, they know what I'm talking about. There's always been an adapter for that fitting. It's larger in size. And uh, so, you know, I think, you know, you brought up trucks, you know, think about the auto industry. Look around mm -hmm. a car that's fairly new when you step into it. I rent a lot of cars. There's little hidden gems behind the walls that says airbag here, you know, right next to your head. All those things came into play after the fact. Okay. Mm -hmm. this, I like being proactive. You know what I mean? Not that anything's going to happen, but isn't it nice yeah. that we're being proactive about all these things to people, to ease people's minds on the possibility of things and not mix and match. So this forward thinking, in my opinion, uh, it is great. It doesn't make our jobs any that more difficult. And it's something, you know, again, we're a tough industry. Um, we'll get through this. It's not that it's not as big a deal. I, I personally don't think, I hope I'm not misleading anyone, but I, I lived through the R22 for 10 days, like most of the contractors and technicians out there did. From what I know, and I know quite a bit about this, obviously, like you do, because I, I teach it. Um, I, I just, a lot of, you use the word, uh, you know, uh, liability, um, you know, uh, that's really the burdens on the OEMs as far as the safety features they're putting in the equipment and on the tank manufacturers. And really, when it comes down to the contractors, the installers, the service technicians, it really becomes down. If you were already doing the right thing, you're going to be OK. You know, mm -hmm. if you're already using good practices, if you were already installing, if you're already purging line sets after you cut them open and removing residual refrigerant, you're going to be OK. Everything that used to be good practice, you're going to see those things now being required. You know, so if you've mm -hmm. already lived in that world and were trained properly, um, you're going to be OK. Everything's going to be fine. I hear you. Yeah, I've been through a couple of these. It's all going to work out. Um, good segue into a question by uh, Ajay. Ajay, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right, but a great question. Do we require leak detector sensors for storage of tanks? If so, what are the specifications? Don, is that something you can answer or would that be more of a Nash Ray 15 yeah. deal or? 
unfortunately i cannot as far as storage of tanks like in warehouses uh, or i know nothing in trucks as far as warehouse i've never seen or heard anything i can tell you this if we're talking about storage um in distributors for example if you were to go to the google machine and google uh ahri a2l storage the first thing that'll pop up is this beautiful trifold colored uh, of racks and how everything's specified uh, they want it to be in a warehouse. Now, that hasn't been implemented yet mm -hmm. uh, in all the states because what it comes down to is all that, all, all those type of things, like if we're talking about distributors, storage, those kind of things, that all comes down to your local jurisdiction. And when I say that, I'm talking about your fire departments. Mm -hmm. So one size does not fit all. The HRI has a recommendation. They have a trifold on what the rack should be, you know, the distance of those, you know, sprinklers and those kind of things. So if you want to refer back to that, and again, I, I show that on a PowerPoint also, but if you simply want to do some homework or you're curious, um, you know, go to AHRI A2L storage, just put that in the search engine. It will pop up immediately. You can print it out. It's a beautiful, it's, and I mean that sincerely, it's a very nice well put together PDF and it's been out there for quite some time. AHRI A2L storage? Yes, and it will pop up immediately. I've done it many, many, many times. I'm gonna use that. Is that something you present in your presentation? I do, um, actually, yes, I do. I put it at the very end because sim most of the time I'm not speaking to those, that mm -hmm. audience, but just in case there's somebody out there that stepped in and took the contractor's class that comes from a different walk of life, I put it in there and show them how to get there. It's, uh, it's free, it's easy, and you can print it out. And like I said, I'm actually looking at it right now. It's a very nice document and goes through each step as far as shelving and all kinds of stuff. It's really, really cool. Super. Excellent. Courtney, if you would write that down, we'll definitely download that and share it on our feed and LinkedIn. And we'll also, uh, I'll put that on my preview for today. So thanks, Tom. That's a great hey, There thing. you go. Love these resources. Take yeah. all the help I can get, man. That's for sure. Um, all right. I'll take... Uh, this one to give you a little bit, be able to give you a little bit of a break here because I know you're, okay. you're. If, if anyone doesn't know Don, he does this a lot, <laughs> has to talk a lot. So I know that's that could be a little taxing. So what are VR? Here's a question we get. You know, what are VRF manufacturers doing to address they tail refrigerants? I'll put my, you know, opinion on it. And Don, I'd love to hear from you too. So A to L refrigerants in VRF systems. There's a lot of piping in VRF systems, right? There's tons of a feed of piping. So my understanding is from talking to a few of the VRF manufacturers, and again, this is one of those things that they're not 100% sure. So they're not really publishing, at least the ones that we rep, exactly what's going to happen, but they feel like there's going to be a refrigerant sensor at the heat recovery box, a refrigerant sensor at the indoor unit, and one on the actual wall sensor. Either all three of them or a combination of those that's kind of what I'm understanding now. So when the if there's a potential leak, they can detect it and, and take some corrective action. Um, again, nothing has been published for sure from any of our, we have relationships with two large manufacturers. We haven't heard um, anything definitive. So I don't know, Don, if you have any opinion on that or experience with that. Uh, I do not. Uh, I would, that would probably be a day I'd like to spend with you just to hear what you know about it and others, because that's one area I'm not. And again, it seems like every time I step into that arena, Tony, you already touched on, it's a moving target. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to tip my hat to you on that one. Yeah. You just heard everything I know. <laughs> so yeah. as soon as I call one of the uh, top guys at one of the big manufacturers say, Hey, when are you going to come on? Can you come on the show and talk about this topic and he said no we're not ready yet because we're really just here and and you know and and i'm trying to find too you know i'll segue this into package rooftop units right so like what are package rooftop units doing internally to the machine because there is going to be some sort of detection required it's my understanding that anywhere there's a potential leak you will need a sensor now on a package rooftop unit that's 100 tons there's a few braised joints in a package you're stopped in, right? There's a th there's hundred thousand of them. I don't know how many, but there's tons of them. So I don't know what that means in terms of will that unit have two sensors in it? Will it have five sensors in it? I'm still waiting to hear from a manufacturer standpoint. You know, as soon as we hear that, we'll translate that to the field. I do know I've seen some snippets of, hey, if you've got, because you can select equipment now with 454B 
um, or R32. And if you do in some of the manufacturers we have, they're saying, hey, you can't put a smoke detector in the unit because we're going to put another sensor there. You got to move out. But still, I'm trying to get clarification and all that. So, um, yeah, yeah. So that's what I know about the equipment, which isn't much. So, yeah, yeah, I, I can say this. And this is very, very high level because I do show a few of these pictures. I don't deep dive into the equipment only because and I've done webinars with uh, not only I, but me and the marketing folks. I've done webinars for six months with the OEMs, all the major OEMs. And mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm just stating facts here, but all the OEMs with the exception of Dyke and have went with 454B. What I do know on a very smaller level for your split systems examples, Tony, uh, at the very least, you'll see uh, some kind of uh, a sensor around the evaporator coil, the indoor coil, depending on which way that air is moving, whether it's an air handler or a furnace, will be depending on where that sensor is on the side of the evaporator. That sensor will go off somewhere between 20% of LFL. Uh, it will be hooked to a module that go down to a mitigation board. Okay. And that mitigation board will energize G, which G in our world will be fan. Uh, if electric strips are on, it will shut that down. If the gas furnace is on, it will shut that down. It will uh, remove that concentration, that air. Uh, to spread it out a little bit uh, once it clears that out let's say five minutes don't hold me to that but that seems to be like the the magical number it'll go back into normal operation the way i describe this is if it's an actual leak and it wasn't a nuisance call it will try this three times and go into a hard lockout something that technicians are already familiar with as far as uh, pressure switches and gas valves and those kind of things so it's really no different than what we're already doing and those kind of things so uh, at, again, at a very high level, that's what I know about the mitigation strategies. At the very minimum, you'll see uh, everyday business on what we call split systems. Awesome. That's great information. Great inside information. And for those who don't know, LFL, lower flammability limits. Correct. Yeah. Learn very that cool. from your video. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Very good. There's a seg there's a segue to our YouTube channel. So on I did this presentation with Don a couple months ago and it was we were on there for like an hour and 40 minutes because we got a ton of questions. It was awesome. But in that presentation is a video that talks about LFL or lower lower flammability limits. It talks about three very critical aspects to um, A2L refrigerant. So go check that out. Our YouTube channel could be accessed by the QR code in the upper left there if you're interested. Just go there and look for the video with Don Gillis on it, and you'll and you'll get some information on that. So good segue there. Um, okay, so let's see. We've got a couple more here, Don. Um, here's a good question I get all the time. What training will be required for HVAC techs handling A2L refrigerants? Okay, it seems like the common theme today. As of today. <laughs> okay. I want to clear As that of up. today, February. I was quoted 15th. in Contractor Magazine a couple months ago stating that I didn't foresee A2L training being or uh, certification being needed until one would think A3 training would be needed, which is not. Right. Uh, and I and I got some pushback. So um, so I want to be very clear about this. Uh, as of today. There is no special training needed to uh, install, uh, uh, carry A2Ls. Will it be included in your EPA card moving forward? Absolutely will, just like 410A was as of today. I do know that, uh, and Clifton would have been probably a better resource on this, that the EPA was open for ideas, and that, that, that got closed about, I don't know, Tony, you might know, four weeks ago. They shut it down. They took everybody's input. Um, I did see HVAC News publish something yesterday about some pushback on testing. Uh, I believe if I was reading that correctly, I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. Uh, mm -hmm. But as of today, there is no special uh, techni uh, training that will be needed for A2L refrigerants, but anything could change. So, in other words, the certificate that I give out for our Comores training, the two-hour certificate, Nate certification, that's as good as it gets, whether it's ESCO, ACA, your company, uh, you know, anyone out there, RSES. I shouldn't have mentioned anybody because now I'm going to forget someone, but <laughs> nothing is Double. federally or state recognized. OK, and if I forgot your name, I apologize. Right. Uh, but just uh, the moral of the story is right. Right. Stay tuned. Hey, if you forgot, if Don forgot you, message me on LinkedIn. We'll get you on the show. And we'll get Please. you a spotlight. How about that? And yes. I'll put a plug in for, you know, if you need some training, Clifton. 
he's the one that I know. Uh, Clifton Beck, you can look him up on uh, LinkedIn. He's with ESCO as well. He was on our show yesterday, so thank you to him for doing that. Um, yeah, an area I, I don't know a lot about, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, next question, I'll I'll ju- I'll put my two cents on this, give you a little breather, and then you could. Uh, so this is from engineers, right? Should I select? R32 or R454B for equipment now if I'm designing a job right now. So if you're an engineer starting a job right now, should you get selections from your rep on 410A or 454B or R32? I would say given the lead times for most manufacturers, you probably want to look at getting a selection with the new refrigerant. So if you get a 410A muted on your prints right now, it's got to ship by the end of the year. So keep that in mind. If you don't think it's going to, then go ahead and change your drawings over. You can always get a new submittal after the year if it's based on 14A. The equipment itself, from a selection standpoint, um, doesn't change in terms of putting it on paper. It is a whole new machine. It is a whole different machine. Let me just make sure everybody understands that. But from an engineering standpoint, if you're designing a job, you may want to look at doing 32 or 454B, especially it's going to ship next year. It'll save you the hassle of having to get new submittals and put out addendums and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so that's my thought on that. And some manufacturers are shipping equipment with the new refrigerants now. So keep that in mind as well. Don, any any take on that? Any opinion on that? Or uh, Again, I'm going to stick with the residential because that's what we're going to see first. The equipment's mm-hmm. not out from my understanding from talking to our commercial re- refrigeration si- side product development that are working with these stores and what have you. Mm-hmm. So the refrigerant's there. Uh, the equipment's not. The first phase is obviously the residential or comfort cooling, if you will. Um, so that from what i understand and uh i can't name drop but certain sure. OEMs are going to start releasing equipment uh the end of this first quarter um then second quarter third quarter fourth quarter again um i can only speak for 454b which again is is most all the oems besides daikin um so what that might look like is 10 percent at the first quarter 20 percent uh 30 100 at the end so it'll be similar to what we saw with r22 tony as we know um you'll have two assembly lines running more than likely and then you'll uh, start to slowly shift to where it's all new equipment with new refrigerant by the end of the year is my understanding and i think i have a pretty good grasp on that because we've known that for quite some time actually so that's what it looks like to me if you're in if you're bidding jobs right now because i get these conversations when the distributor comes in behind me and these rooms are packed i mean our training is getting up to where 50 is a small group anymore usually i'm speaking to over 100 a lot of times, I mean, there are smaller ones, but I'll do multiple for the day. Uh, the manufacturers coming in behind me and they're actually telling them if you're bidding like, uh, let's say, multi-housing jobs, get your order in early. You don't want half of that 300 unit to be 410A and the other half mm. 4B. So as you said, planning in advance, I would plan for the future. That's just me personally. You know, I mm-hmm. wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be, uh, I, you know, if, if it's all that's out there right now and Mrs. Jones needs a new system, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, right. But if it's something you can plan for, uh, I like you. Uh, just re- to reiterate what you already said, I would I would look for uh, whether it's 454B or R32 or whatever you know whatever that equipment looks like. Well said. Okay, what else do we want to talk about here? Um, got a few other things here. What do you think, Don? Any, what do you want to, what do you want to bring up here in the last, we got a few minutes here left. Yeah. What do you want to bring up in the last so, thing? Your, your topics. So just a couple things, uh, things that come to mind that I like to hit on, the, on in every conversation, whether it's five minutes or 55 minutes, uh, whether it's, you know, in the lobby or what we're doing right now is just, just to recap, we're not putting A2L refrigerants in existing systems. Mm. Okay. Uh, a big no-no. Please don't do it for the obvious reasons and the reasons the the obvious reasons we spoke of earlier, Tony. I'm glad you brought that up. The other thing is that I really, really want to emphasize here is because I'm not sure we're getting that message out as on a big platform like you have, Tony. Uh, I think all of us in the classroom are trying to do it in small increments. The job is getting done, but I'm still seeing people walk in every day in the classroom that are coming in with a thought that propane or hydro, any hydrocarbon is in A2L refrigerants. That is just mm. not true, okay? Thanks for uh, bringing too, that up. We get that yeah, all the time, yeah. Too many people are putting flammable refrigerants in one bucket, 
And that's where the confusion starts. I cringe yeah. when I see people, they're going to talk about A2L as the topic, and then they get into propane and talk about A3s. That's where the confusion starts. A2Ls are apples and oranges. You know, a, a, between an A2L, not to get in the weeds here with you, but between an A2L refrigerant and an A2 refrigerant, on the right-hand side of that 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 template is A2s. That, that flame uh, has to travel greater than 10 centimeters per second. A2Ls on down is less than 10 centimeters per second. 454B is 5.4 centimeters per second. You can literally walk faster than that, that flame spreads. Right. And the more air you add to it, once it starts to spread, it puts itself out. You need a lot more concentration of an A2L refrigerant than you do a propane. We know this because we go click our little buttons every day or on the weekends in our backyards to our little grills uh, with that little bit of spark. That little bit of spark will not start an A2L refrigerant up. So my first, my my main job here, my main goal here with, with Camores and, and the training is to remove the fear mongering. This stuff is already being used in the Europe. It has been for some time. We've had it underneath the hood of our cars, 1234YF, for the last seven years. Nine out of every 10 cars has an A2L underneath the hood of your car where you have your families and you and everything mm-hmm. else. Uh, P-TECH units, window units, dehumidifiers, that's all Asian driven. It all has R32 in it. It's already around us, so don't fear it. So enough of that. I'll get off my soapbox on, on that one there. Uh, the, other one, the, the, the other thing I'd like to mention is training, training, training. Whether you do it through our website, optian.com, go to our training page and hook up. Uh, on on demand stuff with Tony, follow Tony stuff, YouTube's channels, uh, podcasts, Esco. You mentioned Esco. I know ACA has a good program, and there's lots of things. I mean, six years ago when I was talking about A2Ls for Emerson, it was a deer in the headlights. Now mm-hmm. everybody and their brothers either doing a podcast about it or writing a book about it. There's plenty of stuff out there. Get your education. Get the training. If you get the training, uh, you will be successful. Okay. Um, and the last thing is for me is, is read the manual. Okay. Mm-hmm. When that equipment starts to hit the ground, the, I commonly say to all the technicians and students that come to my classes, you'll be able to tell me more about this in a year than I'm telling you now. Mm-hmm. Read the manual, do the right things, uh, do all the stuff you should have been doing already, and you're going to be okay. Excellent. Thank you, Don Gillis, for coming on the show. We hope to have you back soon. Would you mind hanging out here for a minute in the waiting room? I'm going to show a few QR codes here for the folks at home. And uh, Don, thank you so much. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate it.